Thank you for your help the other day, Professor. Please, allow me to express my gratitude by taking you to dinner. Fantastic. But please think about what you'd like to eat. After all, such magnificent guidance must work up quite an appetite. I've studied swordsmanship for some time, but your mercenary skills are something else entirely. Speaking of which, there's another question I must ask you. Were you reconciled with the reality of battle from your first foray? With the killing part, I mean? I see. No. I do not carry that burden well. I doubt that will change, no matter how many years come and go. The first time I led on the battlefield, I was sent to quell a rebellion in the West. It was not a difficult fight. The enemy was not well trained and their morale was low. A swing of the lance and your opponent falls. A flash of your blade and a path opens up. That's the sort of battle it was. Easy, right? The noble family from that area sought to seize the throne after my father's untimely death. The leader of the rebel army was defeated and the rebellion quelled. This was at the height of the post-war period. I recall coming across a dead soldier's body. He was clutching a locket. And inside was a lock of golden hair. I don't know to whom it belonged. His wife? His daughter? Mother? Lover? I'll never know. He was a soldier. An enemy. Someone we had cut down without hesitation. But in that moment, I realized he was also a real person. Just like the rest of us. Of course, we cannot stand idly by and allow anyone to commit senseless acts of violence. Yet, in dispensing what we call justice, we take the lives of cherished family members. Beloved friends. Killing is part of the job, but even so, there are times when I'm chilled to the bone by the depravity of my own actions. That you feel the same way is more comforting than you could know. Professor, may I speak freely? When we first met, I thought of you as someone who felt no strong feelings about killing your enemies. I could never trust someone who kills without batting an eye. My heart won't allow it. But after speaking with you and getting to know you better, I can see you're not like that. Now I know, with all my heart, that I can trust you. Thank you for that. You there, youngster. Won't you listen to this old man's troubles? I was born and raised right here in this town. I spent my whole life here. My daughter lives in the Empire, and she sent me a letter to ask if I was keeping up with my daily worship. Well, hello there, Professor. Is this a friend of yours? Is that so? I was sure you two knew each other. Is there something we can do for you, good sir? Oh, what a lovely young lady. I was just telling this kind soul a story. Really? What's troubling you? Well, I was thinking of going to daily prayer, but my leg's been acting up and I can't walk properly. How terrible. That's no good at all. May I be of assistance? I'd be happy to lend a shoulder and escort you to the chapel. Would you? Oh, I'd be most grateful to you. Thank the goddess for sending this young lady to me today. We'll need your help too, Professor. Here, sir, take my arm. Splendid work, Professor. He really seemed to appreciate our assistance. I don't think I did anything particularly deserving of praise. I'm just happy that I could help. You did a great job cheering him up on your own. 
putting a smile on someone's face always seems to brighten up the day. Is something wrong? You're giving me a strange look. Oh, mm, how should I put this? I suppose it's just second nature to me. It's difficult to describe, but I can usually tell when someone is worried about something. Back there, I could tell that both you and the old man were in distress. I spent a good amount of my life living in the church. Maybe that's why I'm so good at identifying these things? Did I not mention that before? I spent nearly 10 years of my life in the Church of Fargus. Many came to us with their troubles. In my own time of need, I once ran to the church myself, and they helped me. May I share something with you, Professor? It's about a dream of mine. I'd like to work in the church one day. I want to be like the priest who helped me. Never mind. It's not a very realistic dream. Please forget I said anything. If I were someone else, perhaps a commoner without a crest or stature, maybe things would be different. It's a bit sad, but this is the way things have to be. After all, only the goddess can decide our fates. <laughs> father never learn. All of these useless letters are only creating more rubbish in the world. Professor? Oh, I didn't see you standing there. My apologies. Oh, uh, that paper. Well, I... Yes. Yes, it was. It was a letter from my father. I understand where you're coming from here, but I have no need of such things. It isn't like anything of importance was written on it. Curious? I suppose there's no harm in allowing you to read it. Go on then. My dearest daughter, Ingrid. Are you well? I trust that you are behaving yourself and refraining from causing trouble for others. Things on the home front are in order. The marriage proposal for you and the Viscount's son should be prepared soon. Although, I am quite certain there are many superior candidates at Garrig Mock Monastery. As you know, the very survival of our family is dependent upon whom you marry. You are the only one left in the family who can make things right. We are all counting on you. Do not lose sight of what truly matters. Yes. Perhaps you found it somewhat entertaining. I've told you that we've never been very well off financially. My noble family, House Galatea, branched off from House Daphnel in the Alliance. Shortly after, we were lucky enough to receive the support of the royal family, allowing us to attain nobility, to some extent. But the territory we watch over is poor. Its harvest meager. And our noble blood, too, has grown thin. Neither my father nor my brothers bear a crest. I, however, do bear a crest. Because of this, my father sees me as our family's one hope for the future. A crest is highly prized among nobles. Were I to marry into a greater noble family, that financial support could soothe our woes. Thank you, Professor. Your sentiment alone is a great comfort to me. Despite my own feelings, I understand his approach to all this. It isn't that he doesn't care for me. I understand it very, very well. Which is why I... I apologize, Professor. I must be going. Excuse me, Professor. May I have a moment of your time? Ah, wonderful. I was hoping you might enlighten me. About yourself, that is. You see, I happen to be quite curious about you. 
Well, because there is something different about you. You possess an air of mystery. I could not help but notice when first we met. I am intrigued, to say the least. I find it rather difficult to put into words. Were I to wax poetic, I would say you remind me of the sea. Have you ever been, Professor? The sea is vast, boundless. On the surface, all seems still. Yet beneath that stillness, it is unfathomably deep. Within, it teems with life. Yet without, one is lucky to glimpse a fleeting shadow. And yet, all one must do is cast a line to grasp hold of all that life. You cannot see it at a glance, but it is there all the same. About fish, of course. Oh, bother. I got sidetracked, didn't I? Right. About the sea. During a storm, the once calm waters become mighty enough to overturn even the vastest ships. Not unlike you. You are calm. You carry yourself with poise. Yet you wield great power. My brother was uncertain of you at first. He once referred to you as a youth of dubious origin. Oh, but please do not think ill of him. He is incredibly dedicated to his work. So surely you understand why he would have doubts about one of whom he knows so little. Nobody even seems to know your age. Incidentally, how old are you? Wait, you do not know your own age? <laughs> you truly are mysterious. Hmm, looking at you, it is quite difficult for me to determine. I wonder... Could you be younger than your own students? Who? Me? Well, I am roughly the same age as the other youths here. Be that as it may, it is simply not the case. Oh, by the way, you should know I had actually been considering enrolling in the Academy for a while. I have endured hard times, but I am so grateful that those very experiences led to my acceptance at the Academy. Oh, my apologies. I am sure you have much work to do. I will not keep you any longer. We must speak again sometime, if that would be all right. Have a lovely day. I... who... Oh, settle down and stop with the knocking. I'll be there in two shakes. Oh, dear. Professor? Is that you? I... just a moment. Oh, what should I do? I can't open the door in this state. Manuela, you simply must quit oversleeping. Hold on. Where are my clothes? I can't even find my... Where in blazes is my underwear? Oh, I... What is my dressing robe belt caught on? I can't tie this properly. It's not even covering... Oh, Manuela. This will have to do. I'm, I'm fine. Just... Oh, just hold on a moment. Oh, hello. Sorry to have kept you waiting. So, what do you want? Excuse me? You had a reason for coming here, I assume. I've put a lot of time and effort into making it possible to talk with you, you know. No, you've done nothing wrong. Let's just say I'm not having a good day. Actually, I didn't have a good night. Never mind. What did you want, anyway? 
You heard from him? The fellow from last night? Huh. What did he have to say? Yeah. Figures. Kind of saw it coming, actually. That's why I came back to my room and went to bed. To get over it. Thank you for checking in on me. Was that all you wanted? Well then, good night. Aha! Found you! You're always nosing around places, aren't you, Professor? Can be real hard to find you sometimes. No worrying about it. I just wanted to talk to you about a thing today. Do you remember how Lady Rhea asked you to come to the office this evening? Well, she told me that I should come to let you know that today's a bad day for doing that, and you should go and see her tomorrow instead. That's pretty much everything I needed to say, I think. Oh, except to ask you if you've seen Sedith around anywhere. Okay, I'm supposed to tell Sedith the thing Lady Rhea told me to tell you, but he's hard to find. Nah, I'll find him myself. But if you see him, then find me, please, and tell me where you saw him, okay? Cause then I'll know where he is. I'll be in the stables if you need me. Gotta put out the fodder before it's the next kid's shift. Don't want her thinking I left my work for her to do. Oh, but if I'm not in the stables and you need to find me, I'll be at the forest up north, cause there's a bunch of logs lying around up there. I figure I ought to chop them up, or else someone might trip on a log, or we might run out of firewood. And if I chop, then it'll save other people time. If it looks like I'm done there, then the quarters need to be sweeped. So if you see Sedith and you need to find me, then I might be there. Nope, this is my job. I'm not giving it to anyone else, because it's mine and I'm gonna do it. Besides, if you help me out, Lady Rhea might give me an earful. I don't know why, but Lady Rhea sure does seem to like you. She's always worried about what you might be doing or not doing. Oh yeah, not that it's any of my business. Anyways, Lady Rhea asked me to do some jobs, so I'm doing them all. Even some she didn't ask for, but I know need doing. So I'm doing them. End of story. And remember, if you see Sadith around, come find me and tell me where you saw him, yeah? Huh? But I just told you where I'd be. If I'm not in the stables, I'll be at the forest. If I'm not... Oh, I see. You're right, I'm all over the place, huh? I don't want to waste your time, Professor, so if you see Sedith, how about you tell him I was looking for him, and then tell him all the places I'll be? Then he can spend his time looking for me instead of you. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. A real good plan. Let's do that. See you later, Professor. Stubborn little... That's it! Nighty night, sleepyhead! <sighs> Guess that's it! Can't let lowlifes like you into Garrig Mach. Nobody likes troublemakers. Trust me. What the... Oh, it's you! Don't sneak up on people. It's rude. But we can discuss your lacking manners another time. Why are you here? You following me, pal? Guess I can't fault you for that, since you seem to have been mopping up enemies without me knowing it. She really thinks I'm gonna try to reclaim my title. <laughs> she clearly doesn't know me too well. Yet she keeps sending fools my way like the stubborn shrew she is. That's my stepmother for you. Shocking. Remember when I told you my little bro inherited House Albrecht after I left? Well, he's my half-bro. And his mother is devoted, to say the least. She'd do anything for him. Sadly, he had the nerve to be born without a crest. And here I stand with a rare one swimming in my veins. She's convinced I'll return one day to take back my title by force. Completely off her rocker, that one. <laughs> if only that were humanly possible. 
Besides, I refuse to concede any more than I already have. It's best for everyone that I take the brunt of her malice. I can handle it just fine. If I wasn't around, she'd shift her beady gaze to my dad. Maybe even to my mom, who fled the house a while back. Or maybe my little bro would become the target of her good intentions. Can't allow that to happen. And that's the bottom line. Long story short, you should keep your distance from me. If that assassin's dagger took you out, everyone here would fall to pieces. How would I explain that? That's... that's a big talk, pal. So, you'll protect me too, will you? To think someone who can keep up with the exalted king of grappling would say such a swell thing. I'm a betting man, so I'll take the bait. Let's see if you really intend to protect me. Or if those were just pretty words. Hey Felix, you free? You don't look very busy. Let's go find some girls to chat with. Chat with them by yourself. You're interrupting my training. Hey, come on. Don't talk like that. How long have we known each other? Long enough, if you ask me. We only know each other because of our parents' friendship. I didn't have a say in it. Is that how it went? Huh. I remember it more like you always following me around. Whenever there was something wrong, like you lost to your brother, or you fought with Dimitri, you'd come crying to me. You were so meek and pure back then. Cute even. Like a baby brother. And that's enough. What? I said that's enough! Hey, sorry. I just came to see if you wanted to pick up some girls. I didn't mean to get on your nerves. Look, you've been getting on my nerves for years. I've tried to be patient with you, but I'm tired of holding my tongue. You're reckless in your personal affairs and in battle, and you're always prattling on about women. Well, if a man sees a pretty girl, he can't just let her pass by without commenting. That's just rude. You're insatiable. Do you ever stop? Certainly not to practice your sword technique. You always skip training. And you never consider how your actions hurt others. Or how you hold them back. That's never my intention. Come on. Y you know me better than that. I'm not really... Look. If that's the impression I've given you, then I'm sorry. Hmm. Hmm, I wonder why. Why does Lady Rhea give you special treatment? You're not particularly strong or good looking. You seem exceedingly unremarkable. Not that I doubt you were a skilled mercenary. Shamir came from the same background, but she doesn't get nearly as much of Lady Rhea's attention. Besides, it'd be one thing if you got brought on as a knight, but a professorship? Unprecedented. I'm not blaming you, I'm just perplexed. And it's not like just anyone can wield the Sword of the Creator. It's a legendary relic, right? And it was casually handed over to you. It's unbelievable. Maybe it's because you're related to Geralt. He was a leader of the Knights of Saros, and probably the finest mercenary in all Fodlan. By the time I joined, he was gone. So I don't know him too well, but he's strong, right? Oh, come on. There can't be a soul in Fodlin who hasn't heard tales of the Bladebreaker. Maybe that's it. Geralt used his influence to help you. But Lady Rhea wouldn't give you favorable treatment because of that. No, definitely not. There must be something more to you. Okay, that settles it. I'm going to watch from afar. Figure out what Lady Rhea could possibly see in you. Whatever it is, maybe I can copy it so that you'll take a shine to me as well. And if I discover that your intentions are malicious, I'll cut you down with relish.
Your Highness, I have a little favor to ask of you. Of course. How may I be of assistance? Well, I was hoping you could tell me about my father. I imagine he was a very different man at home than he was at work. Ah, so you wish to hear about the Gustav that I knew. As you know, he was a knight who served the royal family since my grandfather's reign. To me, he was a teacher of martial arts and tactics. He was someone I depended on since I was a small child. But he was also a very stern and strict instructor. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. He was much the same at home. He chide us if we made mistakes, whether it was with cooking or even how we spoke. Is that so? <laughs> Funny. I suppose in front of his family he felt the need to demonstrate proper etiquette. Wait, are you saying that's not how he was around you? Even all these years later, there's something I recall with perfect clarity. It happened in the autumn of my 11th year. Before the break of dawn, he woke me suddenly, said he'd heard a disturbance and had me grab my bow. Then he set me and a fellow pupil loose on a dark mountain. Our only directive was to go catch a deer. As you well know, autumn in the capital is very cold. Now, imagine being up on the mountain at night with no idea what might jump out from the shadows. <laughs> that, in a nutshell, is the Gustav I knew. <laughs> I can hardly imagine that. He was completely different with me. I recall one other defining detail. He used to speak of you at every possible opportunity. Really? What would he say about me? Are you sure you want to know? There's one story he used to tell from when you were very small. No, stop! It's probably too embarrassing to bear. Is it? Uh, perhaps. Look, I'll promise to forget the stories he told me about you if you return the favor. Deal? Yes, that seems the only thing to do. It's a promise. I did not expect to see you here, Happy. I get the feeling that you didn't come for training. Listen up, Didi. I remembered something. Remembered? Ah, does this have something to do with why you were staring at me earlier? Not ringing any bells. I stare at people all the time. Anyway, do you know Anselma? Anselma? Yes, of course. But how do you know that name? That is what my stepmother was called in the Empire. In the Kingdom, she was called Patricia. Oh, so that's what it was. I see now. What a relief. It was really sticking in my craw. Well, now that that's all settled, I'm off to bed. Just one moment. You may understand, but I most certainly do not. How did you know my stepmother? She used to visit all the time. I think she was friends with the lady who kidnapped me. Friends? Are you sure? I heard the lady helped bring her to the kingdom, but I don't really know the details. Anyway, when Anselma saw how I was being treated, she got angry, just like you. You remind me a lot of her, actually. Are we really that much alike? I'd say so. Come to think of it, you greet people in the same way, hold a book in the same way, you even get angry in the same way. It's uncanny. I share no blood with my stepmother. But to hear you say that, it pleases me greatly. She was the one who raised me. I suppose it makes sense that we would share certain mannerisms. To think that the person you mentioned was my stepmother is... baffling, to say the least. What do you mean? For all intents and purposes, my stepmother was completely cut off from the outside world. Suffice it to say, Few knew that my father had taken a second wife. Sounds... complicated. I can keep my mouth shut if you like. I would very much appreciate your silence on the matter. But thank you, truly, for all that you said. Truth be told, the union between my father and stepmother has given rise to... Uh, much speculation. But for now, what's truly baffling me is the identity of that lady you mentioned. She welcomed my stepmother into the kingdom after she fled home due to political strife. <clears throat> no, I must stop this. It's time to put an end to this discussion. Baseless speculation will get me nowhere. 
Oh, come on. I finally felt like I understood, and then you go and say something cryptic like that. If I can't sleep tonight, I'm blaming you. Well, if that happens, come back here and I'll keep you company. I'll be training a while yet. I wonder... Could Happy's captor truly be her? Are you injured? To do. Saving the day again? Apologies. I'm the one who owes you an apology. You've saved my life how many times now? If I keep being so callous, I'll seem ungrateful. No matter. But... I'm accustomed to it. I'm sorry to do. Why? Because the way I speak to you is unnecessarily harsh. The truth of it is, I lost someone very dear to me in Dusker. The punishment came swift to your people, and when I heard of the slaughters, well, I thought it was a punishment well earned. I thought the people cruel and heartless, deserving of the tragedy that ultimately befell them. But you, you're different. You seem nothing like the people of whom I speak. So why not speak back against how I and so many others feel? Why not question this unfair prejudice and tell me I haven't the right to hold a grudge against you? If you just speak to me, if you tell me the truth about all of this. I do not know the truth of it myself. His Highness says the tragedy was not the fault of my people, but just like anywhere, there were many different people in Dusker, some very good and others very bad. It is not unimaginable that some may have conspired to take part in that wickedness. Perhaps we are merely victims, or perhaps we are regicidal monsters. Whatever the truth of it is, you are not to blame. The people I hate are the ones who are responsible for that whole mess. You, you just got caught up in all of it. Ingrid. You've rushed to my side. You've saved me countless times. I am sorry for how I've treated you. Truly. If you think of me as your ally, that will suffice. For me, that is enough. Hello? Oh, hello. Have you been there long? I was absorbed in this book. Another silly legend? First of all, they're not silly. And second of all, no. It's an essay that speaks to uncommon and challenging battle scenarios. I've been researching such things since you proposed your unique strategy. Listen to this. Your commander gives orders that put your hometown in extreme danger. Do you carry out the orders or protect your hometown? What nonsense. I was talking about real-world tactics, not some dumb ethical question. Whatever your personal feelings on the matter, I see similarities between such tactics and these dumb ethical questions. I haven't read beyond this one, but I think the obvious answer is to follow your commander. The duty and pride of being a knight demand that you follow orders, regardless of your own feelings. But if I were put in such a position, I don't know how I'd fare. In fact, were someone to carry out those orders, I know that I'd attempt to stop them. Stop bothering with all this. You're not meant to be a knight. Go find a husband. Excuse me? You heard me. I know you hate the ideals of chivalry and pride. So much so, you prefer to escape your duty as your family's heir. You have no right to criticize me for my ideals. Perhaps not. At least I know not to heedlessly obey orders. I know not to romanticize blind obedience. 
My brother taught me to think for myself. Don't you dare bring Glynn into this. You're right. Forget it. Ingrid? What's the matter, Annette? You look upset. I'm just so... so sorry. I had no idea. I'm not sure I follow. Take a breath. What's going on? Well, I was really curious about why you're not interested in things like makeup. So I asked some of our friends about it, and... Oh, I see. I imagine they mentioned that my family was fairly poor, and they probably also mentioned that I lost my fiancé. Correct? They did. I'm so sorry. It was thoughtless of me to try pushing those things on you. It's perfectly fine, Annette. It's true, my family struggled financially. It wasn't easy growing up, but it taught me values I wouldn't have learned otherwise. And we weren't so poor that I consider myself deprived. I'm sure my family would have bought me makeup if I had wanted it. But it never mattered enough to me. Not then, and not now. Oh, so you just never sought that stuff out? Never. While I acknowledge it can be fun, fussing over my outward appearance isn't an instinct of mine. When I was younger, I'd usually be found covered in dirt, bugs in my hair, and a big smile on my face. Things haven't changed too much since. Then, when my fiancé passed on, my priorities shifted even further. It reminded me of what's most important in life. Beyond that, it's hard to think of myself changing without him around to see it, even if it's something trivial like how I present myself. But talking to you has helped me realize it's okay to loosen up and enjoy those things, if I want. So, thank you. Me? Oh, I didn't do anything at all. Except pester. More importantly, do you notice anything different about me today? Yes. It's very subtle, but I could tell right away that you were using that makeup I gave you. You could? Oh, that makes me happy. I was trying to apply it just how you showed me. You did great, and it really suits you. I think there's a lot I can learn from you, Annette. You've helped me embrace the lighter side of life I quite like. It's my pleasure. Ooh, this is so great. Want to go shopping to celebrate? Uh, shopping? But what would we buy? That sounds so overwhelming. <laughs> There's a dress I've been eyeing for a while now. I'm certain it will complement your pretty eyes. Just leave it to me, Ingrid. I'll make you the most fabulous night this world has ever seen. Well, that does sound fun. I look forward to it. <laughs> So, what is it, Yuri? You had me come all this way. I need you for something. Have a seat. I won't take much of your time. Okay... My apologies for keeping you waiting. Here you are. Oh, wow! Did you make this yourself? I may not seem like much of a chef, but I know a thing or two about cooking. Looks tasty, hmm? Can I, uh, eat it now? I'm famished after all the training. Have that? That's why I asked you here. I see. Well, thank you. Don't mind if I do. Oh, this dish is divine. The first bite just melts in your mouth, and these vegetables are perfect. The flavors are interwoven together like... Like a dance of swords between two Myrmidons. <laughs> Calm yourself, Ingrid. I'm in no need of a critique. I just want you to enjoy it and take a load off. Aw, thank you. I will. <sighs> that was delicious, Yuri. I cannot thank you enough. I'm glad. Then it was worth all the toil that went into preparing it. You haven't eaten anything for yourself? I figured I'd eat something a bit later. I didn't make the meal for me. 
You cooked only for me? Mm hmm. The innkeeper provided me with some of his finest meat and told me to feed you. I figured if I was going to do it, I'd better do it right. So I popped into the kitchen and got working. That won't do at all, Yuri. Meals are meant to be shared. It seems my stomach got the better of me this time, though. And I scarfed everything before remembering that. Why bother yourself with such trivialities? The meal was a gift. Seeing you enjoy yourself like that is all the reward I need. What way is that? A bit like when you had all that meat stuffed into your cheeks at the marketplace. Like some kind of chipmunk. <laughs> I like seeing the contentment on your face when you cut loose. You do? The innkeeper couldn't have said it better. She's got a real foodie face, that one. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to feel. <laughs> really, though? There are a few things I enjoy as much as seeing a woman indulging herself. You should consider your words before using them. Such a flirtatious comment can only invite misunderstandings. I didn't mean it that way. Let me get this straight. The stars aren't moving, but the ground we stand on is? Yep. We're on a big round thing that's always spinning. And that's why the stars seem to move through the sky. Hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true. I admit I'm having a difficult time wrapping my head around it. How is it you know these things anyway? If you were a noble, it would make sense that you'd have a formal education on all of this. In the village where I was born, there were people who studied the stars. They taught me. A village of stargazing folk, huh? Do tell. I've never heard of such a place. It's a very well-hidden village. It was a small settlement deep in the forest where no one ever bothered us. I was born there, grew up there. But when I got older, I felt like I needed to see the world. I couldn't live my whole life in one place, you know? So I struck out on my own. I always knew you were an odd little bird, but your birthplace makes you a rare little bird. Yeah, well, pretty soon after leaving her nest, this rare little bird was put in a cage. I thought it might be some kind of punishment for leaving the forest. What the hell? You think that because you wanted to live your life, you'd be punished? That's ridiculous. Look at this objectively. Was it punishment, or was it just plain bad luck? There's nothing wrong with wanting to see the world and expand your horizons. Take me. Had I never left that gutter I call home, I'd have gone my whole life never learning how to look at the stars. Yeah. I left my village because I thought I'd find a better life beyond the forest. Now, I'm not so sure. Regret is pointless. What matters is how we live right here, right now. You know? Yeah. Do you ever want to return back home? I could say no, but I'd be lying. I've been feeling homesick lately. Nothing happened there, for better or worse. There wasn't much to be scared of. Everyone said the outside world was dangerous. That beyond the forest, all we'd find was an early grave. That wasn't exactly true, but my life was for sure easier when I lived there. I used to spend my days fishing, hunting for pretty flowers, running around for no reason. A rare occurrence indeed. What is? Seeing you smile in that way. You're always so... I don't know... neutral? That's not true. I smile when there's something to smile about. It's strange though. When I'm talking to you, I can't help but let my guard down. I don't like to discuss where I came from, but with you, I feel like I can open up. You know, I've been thinking a lot about my mom and dad lately. I wonder, are they even alive? To do, hey. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope I'm not bothering you. Looks like you're pretty deep in thought. Does it? I just wanted to stop by and ask, 
It was your turn to cook last night, yeah? Uh, yes. Well, it was great. I was wondering if you could give me some tips. You know, teach me how to cook. I hear a girl loves a man who can cook. Sylvain. Yeah? You are from Fargus. You must understand how it appears for you to spend time with one from Dusker. To be near me is to invite tedious misunderstanding. Oh, please. I don't care who misunderstands what about me. I talk to who I want. Besides, I believe the Dusker people are innocent. You do? Fargus and Dusker have been friendly since, heck, forever. So why would our old friends from Dusker just up and assassinate our king? It doesn't make sense. Sure, there are probably folks from Dusker who don't like Fargus. But do I think there's enough of them to mount an attack and slaughter the king and his whole company of elite guards? It is difficult to believe, considering the discrepancy in skill and number. Right? At most, I can see a misguided group of people from Dusker conspiring with someone else who had plans to dethrone the king. Maybe they were even lured into participating and used as scapegoats. Regardless, it doesn't concern you or the rest of your people. A person can't be judged by the worst of their kind. Or where would any of us be? Besides, people like to talk about me anyway, so let them talk. Okay, you're making a weird face. What did I say? I have misjudged you. I was under the impression you only cared about women. <laughs> well, I'm glad I've cleared up that misunderstanding. But really, there's no way I'm the only person who figured all that out. There must be people who think like me in Ferdiat, including His Highness. Agreed. But whatever the truth, we are still perceived as traitorous assassins. Once a misunderstanding takes hold, it isn't easy to clear the air. Not without solid evidence of the truth. But even if we found evidence that your people are innocent, those negative sentiments wouldn't disappear overnight. The only thing that can change that is time and effort. Depressing, isn't it? Time and effort. Yes, I believe you're right. Man, that got serious. Shouldn't we lighten things up with a nice cooking lesson? Very well. Forgive me. <laughs> it's fine. Honestly, it's pretty funny when you think about it. I did not expect the horse to react so violently when I approached. No kidding. And I didn't expect the two of us to get covered in hay. Animals have never taken to me. It must be as you said. My face is the problem. I have not honed my smile well enough. I deeply regret the trouble I've caused you. Don't be ridiculous, and especially don't be sad. It's no trouble at all, I promise. Everyone makes mistakes. Isn't that what you've been trying to teach me? Yes, I suppose so. It does look like this will take a while to clean up. But if we work together, it'll be done in no time. I am truly sorry. Don't apologize. When it's your turn for stable duty, I'm happy to help. Really? Sure. And in return, you can help me out when I'm on kitchen duty. Of course. By the way, I tried out all that stuff you mentioned before. About how to not be a scatterbrain. I'm still pretty hopeless, but thanks to you, I'm making fewer mistakes. It's probably not a good idea for me to be left alone around knives and boiling water, though. That's why it'll be really nice knowing you have my back. You have changed. Huh? You no longer fear approaching me for help. You simply ask. And now, when the need arises, I will rely on you, too. That was quite a sigh. What's wrong, Ingrid? Tell me, Sylvain. What am I to you? You're my friend. One of my oldest, in fact. An old friend, is it? 
Then why must I clean up the casualties left behind by your... your skirt chasing? <laughs> Nobody asked you to do that. Heck, I thought you enjoyed it. Besides, you're real good at it. I'm excited to continue working with you. Do you mean to imply you have no intention of acting a bit more respectably? Please don't yell like that. Everybody's staring at us. When you were eight, you came on to my sweet, sweet granny. My granny! Come on. I was eight and she was gore... That was a long time ago. Sylvain hit on Ingrid's grandmother? Wow. People can hear you. Please be quiet. When you were 10, we went to that harvest festival and you started making eyes at a scarecrow. A scarecrow? Wait a second. That was just an accident. A tragic, tragic accident. When you were 15, you sought, relentlessly, might I add, to involve yourself with Lord Gwendol's daughter. Who do you suppose made peace with the Furious Lord despite having nothing to do with it? Hmm? Me. Always me, always for you. Every time. What a jerk. You know what? This conversation is over. I'm done. My point is that this has to end. Not later, but now. Fine. I promise I'll try to change. Are you happy now? Thank <laughs> you.